Hello, my name is Shane A. Bassett, the movie analyst, and today's uh, guest is coming from Canada, uh, was costume designer on a pretty cool movie that's around at the moment, Totally Killer, Patricia J. Henderson, or better known as Patty. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Uh, you know, I need a bit of extra sleep, but you know what? Getting up in the middle of the night to talk to someone who's creative as you is not a problem. I love it. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for having me. The J stands for Jane. <laughs> I was going to ask that Jane. So that's that's pretty cool. But I think Patty, Patty Rocks, there was actually a movie called Patty Rocks. Did you know that? I did. <laughs> <laughs> of course yeah. you did. Of course you did. Uh, now, the movie's been released around the world, totally, totally killer. But first of all, uh, have you been to Australia ever? I have never been to Australia. My cousin lives there and it's on my bucket list. Well, I hope you do. There's always, and I say this to a lot of um, creative types, there's a lot of productions down here, television and films. So you never know, you might end up on a job. Well, you know, you guys know how to do it. I really, really love the things I'm seeing coming out of Australia. Yeah, and no, I totally agree. Well, and Canada, of course, too, which uh, where you're based. Uh, I'm guessing that you probably dressed up a lot of either yourself or other people when you were a kid. Like, how did your <laughs> costume design career begin? Was it when you were very little? It began with Barbie. I'm sorry, but it did. Um, which is, it's very funny with the, the movie being out right now because I would make the clothes and my sister would build these grand um, apartments for Barbie when we were kids. <laughs> and now I'm a costume designer and my sister's an architect. So, you yeah, know, that's where we got our start. Well, the Hendersons, the Henderson sisters are obviously very popular <laughs> when it comes to creation. <laughs> Absolutely, we are. But from there, it moved on to I really wanted to work in theatre. And mm. it was interesting. I, I'm a stitcher. I, I love to sew. Uh, that didn't work out so well. And I got my break. Someone I knew had said to me, hey, you're very organized. Um, I like the way you work. I think I was doing volunteer work for something. And she said, would you like to work in film? And I knew nothing about film, nothing. It was on a kid's TV show for a Canadian uh, company called YTV. And right. uh, I was the truck costumer. I knew nothing. I learned a lot. And I said, well, I'll do this for five years. I'm going on 27. <laughs> well, the rest is history, obviously. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are you, does going to work mean work? Or are you like me where you just love work and it's not work? I love what I do. Mm. Uh, there's, of course, there's stress and there's challenge just like there is in any, any job. Yeah. Um, but I cannot imagine myself doing anything else. I do sell, I have a vintage collection and I sell vintage clothing on the side because, you know, once we stop a project, it takes me about two days before I, you know, back going, okay, what am I going to do next? Mm. You know, right now with the writer strike and things like that, we've had to find ways to, or the actor strike, ways to keep ourselves busy. Oh, of course. Yeah, I totally understand that. And when it came to Totally Killer, how did that uh, come about? Was it a was it through word of mouth? Had you worked with any of the producers before or the director? I had worked with Brian Parker, who was our line producer. Right. Uh, Brian and I had worked on um, the Jesse James, the Brad Pitt film that shot partly in Alberta and in Winnipeg. So I, I did some time on that. And then um, I think it was also... I was new to Vancouver. I've only been out here for going on five years. I moved yep. from the prairies and I wasn't sure if people knew who I was, but um, because of nobody, um, the 87 North project with Bob Odenkirk yeah. and Flag Day, the Sean Penn film, people, yeah, they knew who I was. And of course, the horror that comes behind me, apparently I'm known for my horror, the grudge, the Chucky movies. So, you know, the list goes on. <laughs> I was yeah well I've, I've got a few movies I want to highlight a little bit up into okay. our interview but um well the Jesse James movie was directed by an Australian too of course and Dominic mm -hmm. yeah and Andrew Dominic he just did Blonde yeah just did Blonde which I thought was underrated in a way but it was a tough watch good film but a tough watch 
No, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I totally, totally understand what you're saying. Uh, did you have, now in Totally Killer, there's a mask involved. Did you have anything to do with designing the, the mask? Uh, that was Tony Gardner of All Terrain and his team. Uh, I had worked with Tony on the Chucky movies. We did Cult and Curse of Chucky. Yeah. And Tony was hired to create the mask. And I did have a part in it, as did Notch, our director and producers. Um, we all kind of had our say. And then Tony built something that was eventually uh, approved by Notch and approved by the studio. Um, the The... The mask itself, a lot of people go right to Max Headroom, but there was a couple people that we leaned on for inspiration in that mask. And Max Headroom was definitely one of them. But the other two, Dolph Lundgren in the 80s and uh, Rob Lowe from Youngblood, you know, that jawline and the earring that he's wearing. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> well, yep. totally. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hadn't thought of, I thought of Max, of course, uh, mm -hmm. but not so much. Rob Lowe and I only rewatched Young Blood quite recently, another Canadian film. And absolutely. I had the opportunity to work with Rob twice. Yeah. So I think just, you know, remembering <laughs> remembering all of that was easy for me. Up close and personal. That's great. I mean, you <laughs> must must do that with all your cast, getting up close and getting very uh particular. Uh, when it comes to Totally Killer, I called you out in my review in the UK. I was thanking you because of the exquisite what you did to the mollies and the detail. That. Uh, that was so good. And was that, Thank you. I know that was probably part of the script, but you fine tuned it. Mm -hmm. how, how did you do it? Did you watch her movies? Did you, are you a fan yourself? Uh, it was to perfection. I was picking all the films. It was terrific. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it was scripted and it was one of the reasons I really wanted to do the project. Um, I grew up in the 80s also. I was a uh, um, late teen, early 20s in the 80s. And yep. I remembered every John Hughes movie who hasn't watched those over and over and over again. And those were, of course, my inspiration. But I had done a film a couple of years ago called Siberia with Keanu Reeves. Okay. And Molly, Molly played his wife. So I had the opportunity to, during our fitting, you know, sit down and talk about what Molly did for us as fashionistas in, in the late 80s, mid to late 80s. She injected vintage. She injected interesting style. And she changed the world of fashion for, for most of us. You know, I look to her personally more than I ever looked to Madonna, you know, the you know, there was a totally different style. Mm. Uh, the pearls, the floral jackets, the oversized blazers, the little hats, the little glasses, the, the granny boots. It, yes. So how did I create the Mollies? Is that your question? Sorry, I went a little off there. No, you can talk as much about Molly Ringwald as you want. <laughs> She's a personal hero of mine as well. And I, I watch a lot of movies and I grew up watching a lot of actors, but Molly's up there. So that's why I, I'm connected to this film almost. And hearing you talk about her is, is great. So, yeah, I mean, keep going. How, how did you perfect the, the costuming other than knowing in your own head what to, you know, what to put together, the ensembles? Well, I, I, chose, I chose movies specifically and I built boards of all of Molly's movies so that I could have the buyers and myself because obviously I can't do it alone. Um, go out and find the key pieces. So I took a buyer with me and we started down, we started in Pasadena at the Rose Bowl flea market, which is one of the biggest flea markets in North America. And we traveled all the way down uh, the Pacific coast highway. We hit Oceanside where they film animal kingdom and uh, incredible vintage shops there. And then we ended up in San Diego right. and we picked the whole way and so everything that you see for the Mollies is authentic vintage. Well, 98% of it is. There was a couple of pieces I think we added to, to complete the look. Um, but we would we would go around and to all the vintage shops, the fleas, wh wherever we were, I would go, yeah. oh, this is for Molly. This is a Molly piece. This is a Molly piece. Knowing that I had the four girls to dress. And we had three iconic moments throughout the project where I really wanted to show the mean girls as the mollies. 
and I built racks. So I had, I think four, three to four racks. And then when the girls would come in for their fittings, I would bre break things up as per size because they weren't all the same size. No. And as soon as they stepped in, I'd let them go through the racks and, and, you know, Olivia was, she was my favorite. Olivia was the best. And she just kind of had this, I don't know, very calm look on her face. And she's going through and I said, Olivia, I'm having a really hard time reading you. Are you enjoying what you're seeing? And she went, oh, it's so good. And then we just went. So we would put looks together and we would try different things on together. And we, would, we came up with, I want to say at least a dozen per girl that, were then narrowed down to the three that we used and were approved by Notch and the studio. The girls, did they need to brush up on their Molly Ringwald history or were they aware definitely of how iconic she is? I would imagine um, some of them may have had to brush up. I never asked that question, but by the time they got to me, they were yeah, fully aware of who she was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, personally, um, out of all the John Hughes movies, I mean, Marilyn Vance did the a lot of the costumes. Did, mm -hmm. Do you know Marilyn or did you? I um, don't know. She could be someone that I think you two get together and be a great conversation. I think so too. I, I do know though that Molly told me that she had a lot to say in her, her costuming, specifically yeah. The Breakfast Club. And at one point, I'm not sure which film it was, but she and John Hughes went uh, vintage shopping on Melrose together to build characters. So she worked very, very closely with Marilyn. Um, I have heard to, that story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know. I love it. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and of course, this is a typical question, but I'd like to know what is your favorite Molly Ringwald film or is they too hard to pinpoint? Um, I think each one has great moments for me. Um, yeah. I, I do think Sixteen Candles, I, 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 it really spoke to me as a teenager. <laughs> I did not, I wore a pink dress to grad. I hated it. I remember doing this all night long. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when she's dressed up for her sister's wedding. And I don't know, there was, I was, yeah. I think Molly and I are a couple of years apart. So I could relate to a lot of the things that she did. But yeah, I think Sixteen Candles. Yeah, I'm, I'm the Breakfast Club. But I think Fresh Horses, which isn't a John Hughes film, doesn't get enough mm -hmm. credit as well. And, and her costumes in that are good because the character is so different. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Was there any music played on set? Did you, did you visit the set? And, and mm -hmm. like when, you, when you're on any film, maybe in particular Totally Killer, are you on set and there in case there's a, a mishap or a malfunction costume malfunction or do you have helpers that do that I have set people that run the set for me a set supervisor truck costumer set assist yep. bg costume coordinator etc cetera, etc cetera. but I always start the day if we have not established something on on set on, yeah. on camera I do my very very best to be there to open the set so that I'm there to answer questions for the cast or the director or producers. Cause you know, there are last minute things where people get onto, onto set and they look at the costume and they go, Oh, not so great. I, I remember earlier in my career, very early on in my career, I was doing a low, low, low budget film. And I had dressed this little girl in a Laura Ashley print dress. And we got wow. to the location that I'd never seen you know, we were working for a hundred bucks a day back then. Okay. And the wall, the wallpaper was exactly the same as the dress. <laughs> oh, wow. You could stand Sorry. next to the wall and just do that, right? <laughs> I have a picture somewhere of this little girl standing there. We ended up uh, putting her in a different dress, obviously. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's very, very important for me to be there. And once a costume, costume is established, uh, I can move on. Uh, series work, which I've been doing quite a bit of out here in Vancouver, is it's high high paced, very quick moving. You have I can't always be there, so I I'm cool. on the hunt for a great assistant right now that um, can step in for me in those moments and be there. I'm just learning the crew here in Vancouver, oh, even though okay. it's been four four and a bit years. We had. <laughs> um, two years of COVID where we didn't do a lot. So. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I yes. wanted to ask you about that um, before we wrap up uh, towards the end of the interview. 
because it was a tough, tough time for everyone. Mm -hmm. In Totally Killer, I pause it because I'd seen it, I've seen it multiple times now, especially in knowing I was going to speak with you. And background people, extras, they, they're immaculately dressed as well. Do you put as much time into them as well as the leads? Uh, well, 80% as much. I did most of the picking uh, yep. when I was away for the costumes. And then I had Joe Riley, who was my background coordinator. And I, I can't tell you how many people she was fitting a day, but we were pre-fitting everybody. Yeah. And I would approve the looks. But I, I always set the tone on a project by going out and I do the first buys myself especially with background and I'll fill a rack. Okay, here's the Gen Z. Here's the color palette that I want for them. <laughs> yep. Here's the 80s, 1987. This is the type of stuff I want for, for them. I worked really, really hard on this project on my own. Um, I didn't have a, a large, large crew, but it was really, really important for me to get 1987 right. So I was mm. working a, a lot, but I, I enjoyed every moment of it. And once people got in my head, they were able to go out, the buyers were able to go out and bring things back and I'd go, yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> Do you, you as a costume designer have a set budget or does the producer say you can go a bit higher or lower? <laughs> How does that work? <laughs> that's an awesome question. Yeah. Um, I have a set budget. Um, what I do is I break down the script yeah. and I build a preliminary budget based on my experience of what things are going to cost. Uh, you know, you, for instance, you look at um, something like Totally Killer or Nobody, where I have lots of stunt performers mm -hmm. doing all the action and, and the killing scenes. We had to have eight to 12 of each one of those costumes. And that wow. costs. You're dressing background, or pardon me, you're dressing um, stand-ins, you're dressing yeah. the stunt performers, you're dressing the actors, <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> photo doubles. If the actors have worked too long, then we slide somebody new in there. So yeah. you have to have multiples. And it's the biggest challenge right now in the budgets is, A, I think it's something like 30% that you've had to add on overall on the top of a film or television budget for COVID costs. Mm. And then, B, the cost of materials has also gone up 25 to 30%. I used to be able to walk into, here in Canada, we have a men's clothing store called Moore's, which is pretty basic things. I could go get a pair of men's black lace-up shoes for $75, $80. Right now, 150 mm. So, And yeah. it's, it's a difference. challenge to prove this. Yeah. Well, you did this five years ago for this, but now you're asking for this. It's, it's what it costs. Well, uh, I mean, I believe you've got a dedication and responsibility to the 80s, to the 90s, whatever era you're working with. You've worked with a lot of different eras in, in your television and mm -hmm. film career. Is is there a hardest era to nail? Is it is it the current era or because things change so progressively or is it easier to go back in time? I, I much prefer going back in time because there's amazing rental houses <laughs> in, in Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, yeah. England. And, you know, I, I imagine that there's some in, in Australia as well. So we're able to pull from there, but also we've built a wonderful team of people, stitchers and cutters that can mm. build the look for you. Like my dream would be to work on something like Peaky Blinders. Uh, that, okay. That's, yeah, that would be fantastic. I find it more challenging to dress performers contemporary because sometimes people don't like it or, you know, you'll have that one producer that says, Oh, but my husband wears that or, but my wife wears uh, that. And it's, you, you know, everybody has a say on the contemporary right. where when it's period, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember uh, on flag day, for instance, when we were doing our, our 70s moment, one of the producers came up to me and he, he just grabbed my arm and said, what's wrong? And he's like, I'm watching the monitors and I feel like I'm right in the 70s. Oh. And that's my goal. That is my goal is to make it look authentic and, and not too over the top and not too comical and to take people back into that era, which I, I hope I achieved with Totally Killer. Yeah, well, you totally did. And uh, <laughs> you talked about over the top. I've got to mention, I've, I've got her name here, uh, Tara Pratt, who played the teen mum. Now, that is what you call over the top. 
her her scene in particular, but the what what she was wearing. But I believe that's pretty authentic of what people used to wear back in the day. Absolutely. Sorry, are you meaning <laughs> Olivia Holt? Olivia? Uh, yeah. No, there was a teen mum that key uh, that Jamie oh. comes across. Yes. Sorry. 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 That teen mom with the <laughs> the one scene with the one scene. Yeah. She was over the top. It was like she was wearing a, a tracksuit or something of some description. She was. It was yeah. scripted as a Gloria Vanderbilt tracksuit, which, of course, those were very, very popular. We call yeah. them the onion skin tracksuits. Um, we went with something that we had found um, from a buyer in, in Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is the center of Canada, which also has incredible vintage. <laughs> And he shipped that after reading the script and we're like, that's it. And, you know, the headband and the horrible jewelry and the smoking and I haven't done cocaine yet. It was, (laughs) that was, yeah, definitely my most over the top character, but I think she needed that. (laughs) In your um, career, what's, who was the biggest challenge to dress? Is it a a male or a female or is it just doesn't matter? It just depends on, on the day or the actor. It depends on the day or the actor. Uh, um, challenges present themselves in the moment or prior to or after mm. the fitting. I'm very, very open with my actors and I'm yep. very inviting into collaboration. There's a lot of costume designers that I have worked with that are like, this is the design, this is what we're doing, put it on, shut right. up and go to set. I don't work that way. Uh, I think it's very, very important for the cast to believe what they're wearing is part of their look and it enables them to do their, make their best performance on camera. And it's also about the director being happy and the producers being happy, ultimately the studio. It's a collaborative effort. I mean, the producers saying, oh, my wife or husband wears that. I mean, Probably you could make a movie in the 70s or the 80s and their wife or husband still wears those clothes. So you can't win, right? (laughs) No, it's true. It's very true. But that's why I build these (laughs) incredibly large boards. And when I do my show and tells for the studio, I will line the walls with all sorts of reference photos. Right. Uh, And uh, I put in racks of costumes to show color palette. And so people can come through and touch and feel and, all those kinds of things to try and get everybody on the same page before we keep going. You're such a collaborative person by the sound of it on set. So um, that's, that's a, a mark of your expertise. That's, that's good to hear. Thank you. Uh, we'll, we'll totally kill a cast. I'm not going to just rattle off all the names, but Keenan and, and Olivia are so good. Liana is like a veteran already. She's been around for so mm-hmm. long. Um, any mm-hmm. standouts that you like to to hang out with or to dress or to came to you for advice and asked you any questions or they all just as a collective, a great ensemble? Uh, that's exactly it. They were a great ensemble. Each one of them brought something to the table. Yeah. And I think I had the most fun dressing Olivia because her, her costumes were, she was the leader of the Mean Girl. And it had to show and that the others were a little bit following her around. Uh, But I think because of the boards that I had all over the walls, yeah, we would sit back and talk and and point to things and go, well, that's Molly did this here. Molly did that there. And, And but they were all very, very eager to collaborate the entire look. And there was no, there was no drama. (laughs) There was no drama from any of them. I'm so glad to hear that. And I wouldn't expect there would be. I I like all of them as talents and putting them together in this movie clicked. It worked. Uh, When it comes to creating the the costumes, that's one thing. But, you know, you've got to complete the look. Do you, I mean, I don't know if you can help them or they've got their own job to do, but the hairstylists and the makeup people, do you throw in any advice or do they, you know, the three of you work together? I'm not fond of the word advice with other department heads, <laughs> uh, but yeah. I I share my lookbooks. I share the work that I've presented to sure. everybody else. And I was very, very fortunate to have a wonderful collaborative team with hair and makeup. And we did work together. I'll hand over, like, for instance, the headband on that Tara, the teen mom, you know, I because it's touching the head and the hair, I, I handed it over and said, would you please put this on her? But, you know, you, you have to make sure that the lipstick's working, that the makeup's That's what I mean. working. So, 
Yeah, so and also when it came to fittings, um, I always, always share my fitting photos with hair and makeup, no matter which project it's on. And it's up to them to be receptive or not. And they were very receptive to, to work with me on this project. Well, with Olivia and uh, Julie Bowen, you know, basically doing the same thing, were, was, that, was that hard? Did you work with them both the same or differently? Did you, you know, how, how did that work with them? I think I kept the tone the same. Well, when we first see um, teen, uh, adult Pam, yeah. Julie, she's dressed like the Breakfast Club Molly, yes. and we did that on purpose yes. because for my, for me, that was the most subtle of the Molly looks, and that's how we got away with the line of of Kieran and Jamie saying are you even dressed up for Halloween? And she said, yeah, I'm Molly from the Breakfast Club. Oh, yeah. But all, also, we built that whole costume with Julie in mind. Julie wanted to do as much of the stunt work as she possibly could, so I had to make her comfortable. The skirt was a wrap skirt so that she had mobility so she wasn't trapped in this skirt. Yeah. And and the, the blouse that we made had dolman sleeves so that we could hide low-profile padding underneath. You know, we we gave Fantastic. her low lace up boots so that she could have ankle protection. So I had to think about those things more. So with Julie in 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 the costumes that we built, and for Olivia when she's teen pound when she's in the in the quantum drop. That's right. Uh, yeah, we had to find costumes. Uh, we built a little bit, but we, we were very fortunate because retail stores at the time were very much into the 80s, very much into our color palette. So we were able to pull the yellow pants from the gap. There, the, the, there was a place in, in Toronto, or Hamilton, yeah. called Vintage Soul Geek, and they had dead stock of 80s. So I was buying tops, I think she's wearing one of them, that I was able to get eight of still in the package because <laughs> these guys are, are vintage soul geeks. The, a lot of the jewelry came from them. Yep. Do you always want multiples on the jewelry in case an earring goes flying off and you need of to course. replace it? And so th those were my challenges was finding, finding period appropriate looking costumes that I could get in multiples to do all the stunt work. Did you find the jacket or did you create that one from scratch? I, you're the first one I've shared this with. Um, I created this from scratch. <laughs> uh, so cool. I did the, I did the design based on. Uh, I know in the in the film it's scripted as "Can't Buy Me Love," you know, it's how uh, she dressed. Julie dresses in the end, but for me, it was always Ferris Bueller's Day Off and the Sloan Peterson Sloan. jacket. Yes, um, always Sloan. Uh, Sloan's jacket was very, very big in the shoulders and it was very oversized yep. and it was longer. So I took the idea of just simply the white fringe and we did this. So the shoulders are, are tapered in, it's shorter. The fringe has been cut specifically so that it flowed properly when she was running or doing any kind of stunt work. Yes, yeah. yeah. So there's a, a fellow named Greg Soldier and he has a company called The Nines, and he built the jacket for me. There was six of them. And my niece, whose name is Aubrey Sloan, uh, she did all my illustrations for me and to help me present to the studios what I wanted to do with this jacket. Well, well done on that, because that was a, you. You know, it's, it's sort of part of the story as well. And um mm -hmm. I'm glad that I could ask you that question and, and you revealed that answer because it's so you're so intriguing. Um, wow. Yeah. You must have a great lookbook. I mean, do you? I, I, there's so many good fashion books out there, uh, hardcover, coffee table books. Do you? Mm -hmm. Would you put together something like that someday, do you think? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm currently working on, uh, my sons are in their early 30s, and I'm currently working on baby photo books for them for <laughs> Christmas. So that's interesting that you ask. I've never thought of that, but, you know, maybe maybe that's a really good idea. We used to go into interviews with these giant books that had, like, textiles and illustrations and right. tear sheets and and we don't do that anymore. Uh, digital has changed that. I work with a, a computer program that's a presentation program. 
and I grab images from from the internet or but I do have a library um, that I have built myself of actual books. I collect uh, historical magazines and catalogs. Mm -hmm. I think I've got all of in Canada, it was Eaton's and Sears who put out the catalogs. I have things going back to the early 1900s that were put out. Amazing. Yeah, and any my friends that will see them at garage sales or whatever know that I collect <laughs> and, and grab them. So yeah, I have a lot of reference. I have a lot of Rolling Stone magazines, uh, Elle magazines. I've got the whole collection of the September issue going back, the Vogue September issue going back decades. Because yep. that's where our, your ins inspiration comes from, is real people. Yeah, yeah. No, I've got a pretty good collection of Vanity Fair from the from the nineties. Mm. I've lots of other mags too, but Vanity Fair was one that I made sure I I got as many as I possibly could, and a lot of Rolling yeah. Stones. So mm -hmm. that's uh, very good. I did pull from my yearbooks on this one. Okay. Um, so my own and my sister's high school yearbooks uh, pulled a lot of imagery, especially the girls in the dodgeball. We actually used to play that horrid game, believe it or not. It's a you know, my husband and I watched the film the other night and he's like, oh, I remember I was such a <laughs> jerk in dodgeball. Who wasn't? But those little outfits were right out of my high school yearbook and we recreated them. I, I can't say down under that dodgeball was a thing, but I uh, <laughs> not around me anyway. I used to play a lot of rugby and mm -hmm. then go surfing. They were kind of my two things and a bit of tennis. So no dodgeball. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh well in rugby you can get hurt probably a bit more I'd say yes mm -hmm. uh it's interesting you said about digital with the lookbooks now uh what about 3d design I mean people are creating anything and everything just out of a 3d design now do you think you can or is it already happening you know a whole costume could it's... be done by 3d it's already happening I think the program that a lot of people are using is called close yellow mm. I'm I'm I am so busy in my own life right now that I'm debating, do, do I step into that realm while the strikes are on or the last strike is on? Do I yeah. go back to school and learn how to do this? I would love to, but the younger generation is absolutely 100% using, using these programs. Like my niece will just whip out her iPad and go, Ch -ch 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 and it's like oh boy yeah so <laughs> I have to keep up with the times to to and I think you know a lot of people have asked me about AI and about the battle with the writers and the battle oh, yeah. with the actors on AI I I understand the battle my son and I went to see the creator a couple of weeks ago I enjoyed it and it, I really did too and it made me sit back and go okay this is coming oh, yeah. so either i i join the bandwagon and i learn how to do it properly because i feel that there's still a way that my ideas get pumped into the machine if you will sure yeah and and i can control ai a little bit maybe i'm foolish to think that way but so that my the end product is something that originally came from here I, I'm concerned about background act actors becoming mm. AI little visions going through Definitely. because that's that's what sells the whole show for me, especially if it's a period show. Yeah. Like when Jamie comes out of the time machine, the photo booth, and she walks into all and she says, What's the you know what? <laughs> yes, the carnival. <laughs> and background sold the period without yeah. them we couldn't have done it so i'm a little concerned about people not having work because of ai and our, our end product not being as good as if we were able to be hands-on when jamie came out of the uh, photo booth and that that moment you're talking about at the carnival in the 80s it reminded me of when uh eddie murphy as axel foley first arrived at beverly hills and he's driving down the street and looking left and looking right and all the characters that are walking <laughs> past him on either side of the street. That's what it reminded me of. Oh, I love that film. And thank you for that <laughs> reference. <Yeah. laughs> I feel like I'm holding you up. Um, I'll only ask yeah. a couple more questions. Um, I could sit here all night, I guess, because I'm really enjoying this conversation. But 
I will mention uh, maybe a hard thing for you to talk about, but during COVID, sure. what did you do? Were you still getting work? Were you able to continue to at least create or was it a tough period or were you one of the lucky ones that could keep working? It, well, a bit of both. So what happened for me is I had been working 18 months straight and we yeah. had been doing nobody in flag day. And on flag day, we were shooting in the winter and shooting. So we had to wait until the seasons changed. So I was very, very busy and away from home. I had just moved to Vancouver Island, just where I'm from. And I think I, I landed here at the end of January of right. 2020. And uh, everything was locked down by March, the early in March, if I remember correctly. It was so for eight, it was horrible. Eight months, not only did I not have my career, I had just moved and I didn't know anybody. Um, So I had no, well, not that you could go out, but I just, I felt imprisoned, truly. And then a friend of, a friend of mine reached out, his name is Stan Brooks, and he, he directs a lot of things for Lifetime. And I had worked with Stan seven or eight times in my career, really, really like him. And he called me up and he said, so I've got this non-union show and I really want to bring it to Vancouver and I really want to do it during COVID. (laughs) (laughs) So that's what we did. And we did the Mary Gilbert story. It was about the Long Island serial killer, true drama. I did that one. And then I... I with Stan, you know, and when they're MOWs, as we call them, they're they're fast. I think you get about eight days prep when you shoot for fifteen days. Maybe, but of it the was week. exhilarating. Movie of the week, correct? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then um, I went on to do another one, and, and and then film started up again. I want to say about eight months in, and I was hired by another friend of mine to do Easter Sunday with Joe Coy. Oh. You know, it's funny how things work out. Was one of those movies that you worked with Stan on um, Gone Mum? Um, same producers. I yep. did Gone Mum as well, the Jennifer Dulo story. No, that was a different director. But Stan's, um, I believe Stan's wife, Tanya, is the head of Lifetime. Oh. So she, yes. I was just speaking of Gone Mum because Annabeth Gish, of course, and she was in I Mystic, Pe- Annabeth, Mystic yeah. Pizza. So, yeah. <laughs> Such a good era. Um, you've worked with so many great people, including probably one of my favourites of all time, especially in the recent decade or so, is Andrea Riseborough. Like, oh, yeah. the, the Grudge is, was a pretty good remake. I thought it was a pretty good reboot, whatever you want to call it. But Andrea, to me, I've had my eye on her way, way back. Um, how, is it, how is she? She seems like an intense person, but probably lovely. Uh, how is she to dress and work with? Both of those things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she was she was very kind and very lovely, but she is very dedicated to her craft, yeah. very much a character actor. And when she gets into the character, she gets into the character. Uh, the sweaters that we had done on her in the grudge, uh, my I had a vintage shop at the time and my business partner was from Holland. And his mom used to share the sheep, card the wool, dye the wool and make these sweaters. Yep. And she had some still in her collection. So we reached out and said, we really want these old, I think they were early 80s sweaters that she had made. And Andrea loved them. Uh, yep. We came a- across a, a hooded raincoat, which I wasn't sure. It kind of made her feel so- she loved it. She she was very happy with everything that we did and very collaborative, but also very specific about how she wanted to be portrayed in her character. And we worked together very well on that. Andrea was also um, someone that was very instrumental in starting the Me Too movement. So I, I learned a lot about that from her as well. And the, um, yeah. you know, yeah, we are today. <laughs> it, I'm really glad that has progressed. And I mean, it's, it's still never ending, but uh, I'd spoken to Mira uh, Savino, who was also quite prominent in the movement. So yeah, Andrea has a lot of um, bows to her string, a lot of strings to her bow. I like her a lot. I always thought she was so mm-hmm. talented, but there's behind the actor as well. There's so much. Yeah, I may have gotten that wrong. The time's up. Um, she was the one that was well she was involved in both but the time's up pin she gave me my own time's up pin and I cherish that yeah 
That's so good. Uh, you've done a lot of Christmas movies and dog movies, I've noticed. <laughs> and there's even a dog Christmas movie there with Beethoven. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Is Christmas easy to design or do you try and tweak it to make it just look like a different style of Christmas outfit? It's Christmas is not my favorite um, season. <laughs> uh, personally, uh, I would much rather do Halloween. <laughs> ah, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, but Christmas, it's funny that you ask that. We learned very early on when we were starting to do well, Hallmarks and, and whoever the companies were, Universal, that were making all of those Christmas movies, they were becoming a very big thing. Yeah. And we were shooting them sometimes in July. Yeah. Or I remember, I remember saying to people, to producers, you want to shoot this in February? We need to be shopping in December so that we can scoop things. So what we started doing is building our own collection of ugly sweaters and <laughs> things that we could change a little bit for each show. I had people make ugly Christmas sweaters. So that became a challenge. But again, a lot of builds with the right color palettes. And when you're working for, for Hallmark, there's rules that you have to follow. You know, there's no cleavage shown. There's jewel tones. They want pearls. They want very wholesome. So... Yeah. That, that's what you have to strive for. I much prefer true crime and I much prefer doing horror. I'll be quite honest with you. <laughs> I'm happy for you to, to do both. I mean, and speaking of horror, you've already brought up Chucky a couple of times, mm -hmm. the, the child's mm -hmm. play sort of legacy that you've been a part of a couple of times now in two movies. Do you dress Chucky or is that left to the... <laughs> Do you dress Chucky um, or is that left to the CGI? No, people? <laughs> that is, um, that was created, that look was created by Dawn and, and uh, Tony Gardner again. I was just wondering. Way back yeah. in, yeah, 83, 84, I think when they yes. did the first yeah, child, yeah. child's play. And so it has continued, but my challenge with the Chucky costume is that we dress, um, um, we dress smaller people, little people, to be Chucky so that oh. it's not always the, the doll. Of course, And right. then in in one of, I think it was Cult, we had dressed a bunch of big Chuckies. <laughs> so I had to recreate the costume. So I had to find the specific fine wheel corduroy. I had to have it dyed the right color. I had to find a silk screener that would then all the little tools that are on the overalls on the corduroy right, right. that I, we could silk screen the little tools on. And then I found someone on Etsy, I think, that had a knitting machine that redid the Chucky striped fabric for me. And I remember the producers at the time saying, why did you have so much made? I'm like, <laughs> next time <laughs> and sure enough I, I packaged it all up and yep. shipped it off to Universal and when they did the next one they were like oh the fabric's in storage wow that's that's a terrific and being part of that legacy I mean it'll never end Chucky will just keep on going forever I'm sure but well the, the... it's Don Mancini's baby and and it's what he lives for and his series is doing very very well unfortunately I wasn't sure. available when they started doing that but uh, all my all the best wishes to Don and David their luck continues and their success continues with that doll there's been talk about a, another nobody movie um Bob Odenkirk obviously you might have stories about him he seems like a lovely bloke I've never had a chance to interv interview him as yet but uh, is there maybe another one on the cards you can tell me about or um, any stories from the set and Bob? Because it's a great film. Uh, it is. Thank you very much. I really, really enjoyed working with Bob and 87 North and all the characters on, on the cast and the crew yeah. in that film. That was that was a chance of a lifetime and something that I hope to repeat in the near future. I can't say, uh -huh. um, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, I know that um, Derek Coldstad, who had written um, Nobody the first time around, has something in the works. Okay. I, I don't know any more than that. Unfortunately, COVID kind of brought all that to a screeching halt. Oh, so yeah. I know um, Bob was promoting some things on his own Instagram page about Nobody. Yeah. So who knows he's been doing a lot of work in mesa arizona so um i'm canadian i cannot go work in mesa arizona 
<laughs> we'll we'll see. There there are things in the work. And eighty seven North, who does the the John Wick series, the Fast and the Furious, they just did Bullet Train. Yeah. Um, I'm in talks with them for hopefully something in the new year that is not Bob Odenkirk related. Good. Um, Stuart. Good studio Go to be. It's a good studio to be associated with. So whatever it is, I have it pans yeah. out for you, Patty. Thank you. I, I love I love working with them. And Bob was wonderful to work with and very diligent. And he spent two years doing training uh, with his own I personal heard. training wow. and, and did a lot of his own stunt work. Of course, we had stunt people for like, for instance, when he's thrown through the window of the bus, that was a stunt performer. <laughs> but <laughs> um, Bob did as much as he possibly could. And he really became that character on Nobody. I mean, he gets sort of beaten up and clothes get ripped. Now, in mm -hmm. as a costume designer, do you have a second shirt that's ripped or, or is that done with CGI? How does that work? Or is it a mix of both again? For Bob's costumes, I think we had that one look on the bus specifically, but for all of his costumes, yeah. because he was in so much action, uh, we had eight to 10 of each. Wow. So the suede jacket was a Bellstaff jacket that we did we did break down a little bit because you had to find it it came from christopher lloyd's closet it was supposed to be his jacket that he'd worn <laughs> back in the 60s and 70s so we had to age it to begin with yeah and it all depends on how you shoot the action sequence the stunt sequence are we going to see the aftermath first or are we going to start clean and shoot in, in chronological order? Course, sometimes you sense. do, sometimes you don't. It depends on locations, actor availability, I could go on. But in, in that case, we did shoot a lot of it chronologically. Mm. We did have breakdown artists and our set supervisor, Casey, who would go in and, and um, add blood or add rips or add terrors. Uh, but yeah. we did have to match those kinds of things. And Julian, when he gets attacked in the end, um, we had to rig that so that it all exploded at the right <laughs> time. Um, there was yeah. CGI, but we did do a lot of practical in that film as well. I so appreciate practical effects. And, and I mean, people don't realize it. It involves the costumes. So yeah, it's important. Mm -hmm. When you see the end of Siberia that I did with Keanu, uh, he really wanted to shoot practically. He didn't want CGI, and there's a shootout near the end, and the, the winter parka that he's wearing, we put squids in, which are electrical charges mm. that are filled with little bags of blood that literally explode, and that's how we used to do it back in the day, and and we wanted to continue doing that. It's a lot of that is coming back. Flag Day, we sh shot on Super 16 because we wanted it to look grainy and real. And I hope that we get to do more and more practical things again. So do I. Uh, one more name drop before we wrap it up. And mm -hmm. it was early in your career. She's not Australian. She's a Kiwi, but she's very prominent. Anna Paquin uh, oh, in Anna. Blue State. Now, yeah. she's terrific. Uh, always applause whatever she is up to. Oscar winner, of course. Uh, do you remember going that far back and working on that indie? Mm -hmm. I, I sure do. It was, I was working as, I think, a set supervisor or as an assistant costume designer. Yep. And if I remember correctly, I got a phone call directly from her. Oh. And I did one of those, you know, um, really? Uh, it was early on in my in my design career. Yeah. And she said, yeah, the budget is however many thousand dollars it was. It wasn't very many. Right. <laughs> and so I called it the beg, borrow and steal show. And I would go into <laughs> friends closets and, and, you know, actors would bring in their own things. But Anna was a producer on that show. And she yeah. was one of the leads. And she was wonderful to learn from, wonderful to work with, because she was actually born in Winnipeg and then moved. So she was, she said she didn't remember any of Winnipeg. That's where we shot that film. Yeah. No, I, it was, that was the start of my career in designing. I, I wanted to mention that because Anna's just grown up in front of our eyes and you working on that movie yeah, at so an early part of your career it's a mix a match mm -hmm. made in heaven basically 
It, it really was. And Breckenmeyer played against her. Uh, yeah, he's good he too. Oh, I think too. For road trip, I think. Yeah, no, we had a really, really good time. Remember now, she did have an accent. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, full circle, back to Totally Killer to finish off the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I always like to ask people who have worked on movies that we're talking about, why should people watch it? I mean, from a costume point of view, for me, it's a trip down memory, memory lane. I've already told you how much I um, have this much, uh, I think so much of Molly as a person and an actor and, a, and an icon, but how, why should people watch it in your own words? Like it's a pretty good movie to begin with. Oh, thank you. I think it's a wonderful movie. I think it brings so much for so many people. It brings people of my generation. There's a, a little bit of each classic film there, now cult classics, if you will, yeah. into the forefront. The humor, we don't have enough humor in our lives right now. You turn on the news and it's like, oh, I sure, see something yeah. else. Um, the humor, the the casting, the acting, I think everything, all, well, in Notch, of course, is our director, Nahash Takan. Uh, I don't know how to finish what, that off. What can I think you say? watch it and prove prove me wrong. Yeah, I think there's. I haven't seen many poor reviews at all. I don't think I've seen any. Everybody's quite liked it so far. Yeah, no, I can I can endorse it. I loved it. I've seen it a couple of times, uh, and a third time where I was pausing it a lot just before our interview, so we could I could bring up things. Uh, I think that maybe the next move could be you could do the Shurs, maybe the uh, the Alyssa Silverstones from all her movies, <laughs> Excess Baggage, Clueless, what oh, else? Yeah. The, the Crush. <laughs> you could yeah. uh, create some designs then and put a gang of girls together, the Shurs or the... Uh, For sure. Oh, that yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. The Alyssa. I see... <laughs> I see the yes, I see the killers, the killer um, going back in time further. That's kind of what I'm hoping for, uh, because his costume could fit in the 50s, the 60s, and we built it specifically so that it could, ah. you know, trans could go through. That's my wish. I I hope that he goes back and even well, further. We always we'll go see. back to the 1970s and have the Diane, the Diane's, the Diane Keaton. You know, the Annie Hall look. Any holes. That would be, I love it. There you go. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you don't have to hire me, but I'll be the first in line to buy your lookbook, your coffee table book, if you ever put anything together. Oh, I think that's a wonderful idea. Thank you for giving me that thought. 